The Bain Free Radio Hour. On the podcast, when your gravity fails and negativity don't pull you through, don't put on any airs when you're down on Rue Morgan Avenue. Contested ejections and space-worthy erections. Plus, we continue with the complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. All right now. Welcome to the Bain Free Radio Hour podcast. It's an honor to have you along. I'm Bain Editor Tony Daniel. This time we have an interview with neuroscientist and science popularizer, Dr. Robert E. Hampson. Rob discusses his recent nonfiction article for the Bain.com website. That article's title is Homo Stellaris, Becoming the People of the Stars. It's a wonderful discussion of what interstellar space exploration will really take from humans and the gaps in our knowledge we need to overcome if we are ever going to attempt it. And we also continue with the complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. Now here's the news. The January contest continues for a few more days, and you can get in on a chance to win a signed hardcover edition of Robert Butner's The Golden Gate. So in The Golden Gate, a biotech billionaire develops a system that lets people live to the ripe old age of a thousand plus. Sounds like a great deal for any number of reasons, but what really got us at Bain excited about the concept was that it would allow us to witness the future. So let's say your life expectancy is increased to a thousand years. What technological advance would you be most excited to witness in your lifetime? Put on your prognosticator's hat and let us know in a short paragraph. The winner will receive a copy of The Golden Gate signed by Robert Butner and will receive his or her future delivered on a silver plate by alien copyright lawyers who are listening in and hoping to purchase dramatic rights. Details are at Bain.com, right over there on the left-hand column of the main page. It's a good book, The Golden Gate, and a cool contest, so get those entries in quickly to make the deadline. I want to welcome Dr. Robert Hampson to the podcast. Hello, Rob. Hi, Tony. Uh, Dr. Robert Hampson is a neuroscientist with a keen interest in human health and space. He has reviewed research projects for the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and the National Space Biomedical Research Institute and is involved in research on the effects of radiation on the human brain. He's better known to Bain readers and SF convention audiences by his pen name, uh, Ted Roberts or Dr. Ted Roberts. We've had several um, of Rob's articles before um, on uh, the Bain.com website. We now have an article up. Um, that is uh, just coming down from the website and going into the free nonfiction 2016 uh, free downloadable ebook. That's where you'll find the essay that we're going to discuss today. Um, and you go to Bain eBooks, you go to Bain.com, go to Bain eBooks, and uh, do a search for that uh, free nonfiction 2016. The article is the last one because it was a December article. Um, and it is called Homo Stellaris, Becoming the People of the Stars. Rob and fellow Bain author and space scientist Les Johnson are collaborating on an anthology of science fact and fiction based on many of the issues that uh, the article brings up as well. So uh, tell us about Homo, what does Homo Stellaris mean? Is it a, did you coin that word or is it something that you've heard around? give credit to uh, Robert Kennedy, who is an engineer who was working with me uh, at the time. We proposed this as a working track topic for the Tennessee Valley Interstellar Workshop, also known as TVU. It's a group of uh, space enthusiasts, primarily engineers and scientists, although we include uh, quite a few writers as well in the group. Yeah, I've been. And we get together... You've been there, yes, you have. Uh, you've participated in some of my working tracks and panels. The, what we do is about every 18 months we have a symposium, and as part of the symposium, we like to look at some of the big questions. 
And I propose the question, what do humans have to do? What do we need to become in order to go out to the stars and thrive? So I had the idea, I said, okay, the people of the stars, uh, my friend Robert Kennedy, who is an engineer, works in space sciences, said, oh, well, then that should be Homo Stellaris. So that's where the name came from. So one of the main points, I guess the main point of the article is that human engineering, uh, that is engineering humans for space should be naturally and organically evolved rather than imposed externally. What, what does that mean uh, in general, first of all? Well, to start with, there's the law of unintended consequences. If we were to specifically attempt to engineer humans for a particular environment, we could succeed, we could fail uh, catastrophically. What we, what our group, we, we had a number of, of very fine minds come together, discuss the topic, and said, we actually need a more gradual, a more natural method of trying to determine what adaptations we need. The biggest adaptation is going to be to the absence of gravity. We have astronauts in the International Space Station who spend six months at a time on that station living in a, basically living in free fall, where they do not have any gravity. And on the ground, the water in our bodies, the fluids, are pulled down to our feet. Yeah. Uh, before we go on, Rob, uh, I, I want to emphasize that, uh, which we maybe didn't, I just realized, is that what we're talking about is what we would need to do for interstellar flight, right? Right. Or interstellar travel. Okay. Interstellar, well, even for inter interplanetary, but for inter we're, we're actually going to get into the issues of interstellar as well. But the first thing we have to do is we have to adapt to the environment that we're going to be in as we go as we get there. All right, the water being. So the water is one, and people in orbit tend to get very stuffy because the majority of fluids are not drawn to their feet. They distribute normally throughout the body. And so the pressure in the head increases, pressure in the sinuses increases, pressure in the, uh, in the inner ear increases, and it causes all sorts of changes. Now, the... We started with the idea of a more naturalistic change versus something specifically engineered. As an engineer, one idea might be, okay, we need valves. We need valves to keep this from happening. But if we try to engineer something, the biological equivalent of a valve into a human, we don't really know what it would do under the conditions in which it's not being used in orbit. On the other hand, we know that the human body is adaptable, and over time, the astronauts adapt to having their uh, having additional pressure and ha in their head and above the heart. So then the question becomes: Is what do we? What could we do to speed up the adaptations? What can we do to enhance the adaptations? What can we do to ensure that the body makes all of the adjustments itself, in as opposed to having to? Having to do that artificially and make that for us. So that's the idea between be, behind um, a more naturalistic adjustment and a you know artificially imposed adjustment that we might do to a human. The other idea is let's take some time and figure out what it is we have to do rather than trying to jump ahead of ourselves and say, okay, first thing we have to do is adjust a person to no gravity, then we have to adjust them to radiation, then we have to adjust them to, and then make a whole list of all the different conditions they might face. One of the things you did was uh, rule out world ships. Um, why, why was that? What's the... The reason why we ruled out world ships is because part of our charge was getting humans out of the solar system, out to other star systems, and out to other planets. World ships are a great idea in terms of a place for humans to live that's not Earth. But one of the things that was discussed as part of our group 
was that once you engineer a world ship, why would you ever leave it? Why would you ever want to go to another star? Why would you even bother with going to other planets? And so we were asking a fundamentally different question than the one that could be answered by saying, build a world ship and put people in it. So a world ship in this case, let's back up and define, a world ship is essentially taking an asteroid or building a huge ship and copying Earth's environment inside it. You're going to have to have air. You're going to have to have food. You're going to have to have uh, something, places for people to live. You're going to have to have things for them to do. And you're going to want animals. You're going to want plants. You're going to want uh, to just essentially copy Earth inside of whatever this ship is. And so, again, our question was, if you've created this place for people to live, why would you then necessarily move it to other places because it would be slow. It's a very large construction and it would be very slow to move it. Then you might have generations pass by the time you get to the other stars and you run into the issues that have been covered in science fiction quite a bit, such as Heinlein's Organs of the Sky, in which the people have forgotten what they're doing. They've lost their history, and they don't know that they're in a ship. So that's why we ruled them out. It didn't fit the question. It was not the answer to the question we were asking. So what would be analogous um, environments that we might look at? Well... I mean, you you mentioned in the article um, things that we could start from knowing. You, You mentioned the article Submarine Crews. Submarine crews, I've actually had several conversations with individuals who are submariners. They have worked in the, uh, worked on a crew, spent very long periods of time in isolation from the rest of the world. So they all, they already understand confinement, isolation, small crews, um, and the mission oriented structure, a social structure. They have their own uh, very specific social structure, and they understand mission objectives. So this is a starting point of having some group that has to go to the stars, and they were is wants to go to the stars, I should say, and yet we can't build huge worlds, and we can't step into a transporter and automatically, instantaneously be in on this other planet. So let's start extrapolating from the technology we've got. And what is the group that is the closest real-world, present-day analogy to a Starship crew? And that would be a submarine. And then what we would then be looking at is how are we going to be able to get to our nearest stars? We've got a number of planets identified, and some are beginning to look like very high likelihood of something that might be Earth, the 5 to 15 light year distances. Now, we can't come up to that kind of a speed, but our engineers say we might be able to get you up to one-tenth of light speed. We might be able to get you as high as uh, two-tenths of light speed or three-tenths of light speed in a hundred and so years. So then in order to get to a planet around a star that is 15 light years away, we have to look at a 150-year journey. The world ship people, uh, in they actually had a separate track, working track, at the uh, TVU Symposium in 2016 said, okay, well, it's easy. You send them out in a world ship and you have generations pass. And then three, four, let's see, 150 years, we're talking about six and a half generations uh, using a 20-year generation. Six and a half generations later, they arrive at a planet, and then the people who've lived inside the world ship are going to go to another planet. We took a different tack, which is, what can we do to ensure that the same people who start out are then 
awake at the end of our 150-year journey. And that became a question of what can we do to prolong human life? What can we do to suspend human life for a period of time? And then we, then we start to look at another problem, and that is the fact that the humans who start this journey are going to be the same ones who have to explore uh, the new world. And the new world may have a different gravity. It may have a different atmospheric pressure. It may have different percentage of, of oxygen. Uh, it may have different foodstuffs that are totally incompatible with human life. Uh, one example would be the sugars may be a totally different structure or the proteins may be a totally different structure or it may even be life that doesn't use DNA as we know it. So then we logically we go from there into what would it take to ensure that our humans can survive. And more than survive, we want humans to thrive. We want them to be able to live there. We want them to be able to grow there. We want them to be able to colonize. Um, and so those are all the types of questions that we ask. And that's the, uh, our conclusions were that there is a number of different areas that we need to promote in our technology and our biological sciences before we send people to the stars. We've had this discussion before. I mean, there's a lot of stuff we just don't know yet. Um, you wrote a great article on having a bio lab in space to, to find some of this stuff out. Um, what are some of the risks that, um, that we'll see? There's, you identified four areas and you said there's like maybe NASA or human research, uh, roadmap identified a bunch of gaps in the current scientific knowledge about what, what are the critical questions that we need to, to look at for long-term space? Right. Well, there's four main areas. NASA has a list of 33 human risks that they associate with long-duration uh, presence in space. For NASA to talk about this, they're talking about these are the risks that we, we as humans would face just going to Mars and back. And there's differences in gravity. There's space is a high radiation environment. There are all of the problems with isolating the crew and its distance from Earth and the communication time back to Earth. And then there are a number of problems that arise simply from the design of the spacecraft or the design of the habitat that could cause problems. So there's actually 33 different risks. Uh, we put a table into the article that lists those risks, but just a couple of them is spaceflight can change cardiac rhythm. And the cardiac rhythm can actually lead to problems with bone fractures and healing bone fractures. So that's a problem that is associated with the gravity. Um, there is a risk of decompression sickness. What happens if the spacecraft or the habitat loses pressure? We've seen that in the movie The Martian. We saw that in 2001 where there are, uh, you see an illustration of a catastrophic decompression, uh, either uh, unintentional in the case of the Martian or intentional in the case of 2001. And so this is a consequence of the design of the spacecraft and the habitat, and it's another risk, decompression sickness. Carbon dioxide builds up in a closed environment, and when carbon dioxide uh, builds up, people get headaches, they start to have faulty judgment, they become sleepy, and they can eventually pass out. You also have difficulty breathing, so that's another one of the risks. And our radiation environment, both on Earth and in the International Space Station, is still very much protected from all of the radiation that a crew would encounter between planets and between stars because the magnetic field of the Earth protects uh, the Earth the surface of the Earth, obviously, as does the atmosphere, but the magnetic field also protects the International Space Station because it's still very well within our magnetosphere. This is something I brought up both in the Homo Solaris article and in the one about a uh, biolab in space. 
So there are just a number of different things that we have to look at. When we start going to other planets, we're going to have to add to those risks the gravity of the new planet, the atmosphere of the new planet. Are there gases in the atmosphere which are not harmful at all in very low concentrations, but they might be more harmful if they're in a higher concentration. You know, what if the methane is higher? What if the carbon monoxide is higher? What if the uh, what if the sulfuric, the, the sulfur dioxide is higher? What uh, what do we have to do? How do we protect our humans? How do we adapt our humans? So those are the types of things we're talking about with risk. And the um, the social risks that you also bring up closed environments, isolation, and does it, we we can we have some ideas about what that is like and how humans re react, right? We've had crews up in the space station for long periods. We do. We have a number of things we can do. We talked about the submarine crews at six months. Our ISS crews, our individuals are up for about six months. Even the highest number of people we've had in orbit, seven people on a space shuttle, uh, plus whoever, uh, when space shuttle missions go to the ISS, it's usually about five people or work on the shuttle and then uh, anywhere from three to five people on the ISS. So the largest group we've had in space at any time is still extremely small compared to um, a submarine crew. But a number of experiments have been done on Earth. A uh, habitat in Moscow, or in Russia, uh, at the Institute of Science that hosted the Mars 500, which was 500-day simulated mission for a very small number of people. And again, we're talking about 110 people in these groups. There's also a habitat on the uh, slopes of Mauna Loa in Hawaii called High Seas. And they run six month simulated missions with uh, five to seven people in their habitat. And so we've done a number of tests. People can get along in those circumstances. But what happens when they're out there for a year? five years, 150 years. These are questions that we don't know. And getting back to something you said earlier, one way is to just get out there, away from Earth, go to Mars, go to the asteroids, and put together a ship and go as far out as we can get, turn around and come back, and see how the crew does, see what conditions they face. And we go out there, follow up all those robot probes with some manned probes, and make sure we can do this. So what are, um, it, I mean, it seems like the conclusion that you drew at the beginning and that, or that, that you presented is to face these uh, risks and problems uh, by working on the people rather than the spacecraft necessarily. Would that be accurate or? I think it is because working on the spacecraft gives us the same, the, the same results as sending a robotic probe. Uh, working on the people gives us the ability to put people out into space. So yes, we can take a spacecraft and add extra shielding to it so that it protects against radiation. But what happens if there's a hole? What if there happens if there's a gap and the people inside get exposed to radiation anyway? What happens when we have a spacecraft that has been basically built like a giant compressed air cylinder so that it has thick walls that will always hold the atmosphere no matter what and so that the human inside never has to face low atmospheric pressure or decompression or low oxygen or any of that stuff, and then it fails. Working with the human organism to also develop some adaptations to these conditions is fail-safe. It's a fail-safe for our machines failing to ensure that the human itself can get out there. The other 
reason for working with the people themselves, working with the humans, is so that we enjoy it when we go. Because I'm sitting in an office today, but I have an open window with sunlight coming through it, which makes it a lot more tolerable than sitting in a dark office with no windows and no way to see out. When we send colonists to Mars, when we send explorers to the asteroids and eventually to other stars, they're going to want to see out. They're going to want to get out. And if we always have them cocooned in a engineered environment that is totally protective, they'll never get to interact and they'll never get the excitement of being the first person to go to another planet, go to another star. So it's one of the reasons why it's not simply enough to make sure that our spacecraft and our habitats are going to protect our humans. We want our humans to be adapted as much as feasible to the environment so that they can get out and interact with it. It's not to say that humans are going to be totally proof against vacuum, and we're going to still need spacesuits. We're still going to need uh, chips, but we're going to want windows at the very least, and we're going to want a way to get out and move around. There's also other constraints that we just can't overcome with, uh, you know, the like um, old age. Um, and if it takes a long time to go, uh, even at a fraction of the speed of light kind of travel, uh, it, it, it's going to require something either if, it, if you don't go for a generation ship, which you've mentioned is a, is, is a different thing entirely and brings its own problems of will you ever get off if you like it so much and you've grown up there, um, is uh, hibernation and, and such. Um, and you have a little, uh, you, you have a discussion of that in the article. I do. And I have to credit uh, uh, Bain science fiction author Chuck Gannon for a lot of the discussions that came out of that that prompted me in that direction. Uh, it's a discussion he and I have had off and on for a couple of years now, is what would it take to have a form of hibernation for humans? There's some very interesting uh, information out in the in the medical literature now that suggests that it will be possible at some point in the future to hibernate, cryo sleep, um, or whatever, or suspended animation, or whatever term you want to use. That there may be some way to allow humans to sleep for an extended period of time during these missions. First piece of evidence is that we know that a person who is exposed to very cold water, uh, basically winter time drowning events, uh, individuals are able to be revived with a little, with with much less consequences when the body temperature drops. And if they're in very cold water, um, then we know there's a time limit. You know, how long can a person go without oxygen? How long does the brain continue to function when the heart stops beating? Um, if a person, if, if the heart stops, circulation stops, they stop breathing, the, heart, uh, the blood start, stops flowing. Most doctors say, okay, there's a countdown clock. We've got five minutes to revive the person. Um, that's an arbitrary time. It's, it's in that approximate time range, but we've got five minutes. However, if that person has been immersed in freezing cold water, it might be 10 minutes, and it might be 20 minutes. So one of the techniques that is used in surgery is that when open heart surgery has to be performed or when uh, major, major surgeries have to be performed in which the blood flow is reduced, the oxygen flow is reduced, one thing that they will do is they will cool the patient down. Uh, they will run the blood through a, uh, through a system that will refrigerate and cool the person down. And it increases the amount of time that they have before damage sets in. There are Arctic cod 
that basically have uh, antifreeze in their uh, in their bloodstream, in in their equivalent of a bloodstream, and it enables them to hibernate for a period of time. So if we could copy and we could engineer something akin to that, then we may have a method for um, chilling a person down to very cold temperatures, which then prolongs the period of time at which they can survive with low oxygen and low blood flow for a much longer period of time. We're not talking about absolutely freezing a person, you know, turn them into what was... Uh, Larry Niven's term was a corpse sickle, um, not turning them into an ice cube, but slowing them way down. And we also have known for years because of the need for battlefield replacements for blood, for a person who's lost a lot of blood in a trauma, in a traumatic accident, in a battlefield incident, that there are uh, substances which can be tolerated by the body, which can carry oxygen in the bloodstream that are not human blood. Uh, they're basically um, uh, chlorofluorocarbons can do uh, this type of, of role, and there are other chemicals being developed. Um, there are government agencies, research agencies that are looking into these because they're very useful for how do you treat a patient who's been a, in a traumatic accident. So all of these techniques put together begin to suggest that there, we're developing techniques that might allow us to slow the heartbeat down from 60 times per minute to once every 10 minutes and to slow the uh, to slow the blood flow down and the oxygen delivery down to the various organs of the body, particularly the brain, that would allow those tissues to not use up energy, not use up oxygen very quickly, and yet still be able to be revived when you want to bring back to a normal state. This would then give us something very akin to cold sleep or cryogenics or hibernation or any of these things that we talk about in science fiction a lot. And so the potential is out there. And what it would do would be to allow us to put a crew in hibernation for the 100, 150 years it might take to get to another star. Well, what are some of the, the types of, in, of adaptations that humans might need to uh, have, undergo, um, develop? Well, I think what we need is we need to develop more tolerances. Um, humans are evolved for 20% oxygen atmospheres and uh, Earth's normal gravity, and we are evolved to drink approximately uh, two liters of fresh water a day and to consume about uh, 15 to 1,500 to 2,500 calories of mixed protein, carbohydrate, and fat a day. So the type of adaptations we may need for other planets would be to tolerate um, higher or lower oxygen concentrations. Low oxygen makes us very sleepy and weak. High oxygen is actually fairly toxic, especially if it's under pressure. We do not know yet how much gravity the human body needs to function normally. We have experience with Earth. We have experience with the International Space Station, which is in free fall and so effectively at zero gravity. And we have some limited experience with the astronauts who walked on the moon who experienced one-sixth gravity. We know that having no gravity is bad for several organ systems and muscle systems and bone systems in the body. But we don't know if the one-third gravity of Mars is going to solve that problem. Uh, so that's an adaptation we might need. Uh, I've mentioned uh, adaptation to uh, different types of, uh, of air environments. We know that a little bit of methane or a little bit of uh, uh, hydrogen sulfide in the atmosphere smells. We can tell. We can, if it's a high concentration, then yes, it's poisonous to us. 
but perhaps an adaptation might be a greater tolerance to some of these trace uh, compositions in the atmosphere. And our diets may very well need to change. The evolutionary adaptation of the human body is to a mixed uh, protein and carbohydrate and sugar and fat diet. But if we find that the planets that we are going to go to and that we're going to live in necessitate different types of diets, then we would need to adapt ourselves to that. The, this doesn't even go into uh, how we might adapt to lower pressures, uh, atmospheric pressures, higher atmospheric pressures, or radiation. So to get to that last point, then another thing that may need to be adapted is the human body's repair mechanism. We have a means of repairing uh, damage to cells. We have a means of repairing damage to DNA. We know that when that goes awry, we have cancers. And we know that when it fails to work at a reasonable period of, uh, a reasonable rate, then we see the diseases associated with old age. So perhaps the number one adaptation would be to make and to allow the human body to repair itself much more easily than what it does now. Another thing you talk about, uh, the group talked about, and you bring up is the is that there's a serious problem with lack of will in larger society. I'm sure that none of us, uh, none of our listeners, or very few of our listeners, uh, wouldn't jump at the chance to to explore. But um, that's not necessarily true of humanity in general. Um, and some science fiction uh, authors have pointed that out in some some pretty acute. Uh, ways, uh, Arthur C. Clarke, Isaac Asimov, et cetera. What's the solution to the will? <laughs> I mean... Well, I think that the science fans, the people listening to this podcast, are the answer to the question of having the will to proceed, of having the will to explore. I, I think that that is our job as science writers, as science fiction writers, as, as editors and publishers, and as fans, is that it's our job to promote it. But we have a number of limitations. Our American political system is based on two and four year cycles. Uh, we change our political leadership. Uh, we change uh, the House of Representatives every two years. We change our president every four years and our senators every six. The the United States military cannot budget any project for more than two years at a time. They can make long-term plans, but the actual budget gets written for only two years at a time. Our NIH research institutes generally operate on three- and five-year uh, intervals for projects. So in order to look at something like a Mars mission, or let's, let's, let's dream a little bit bigger while still staying in the, uh, in the solar system. Let's talk about a mission to go out to Saturn or Pluto and explore around and see if there's any resources we can get and come back. That is going to be a 100-year target because we're going to have to develop the technology, we're going to have to build the ships, we're going to have to improve our drive performance, we're going to have to put people on those ships, we're going to have to send them out and acknowledge the fact that it's going to take months to years to complete those missions. And we, we as a people on Earth at this time are not used to thinking about things that are going to take longer than five years to accomplish. So it'll be a have to develop some kind of cathedral building mentality, perhaps that used to exist. Actually, I think that's a great analogy. Is that cathedral building is something that took that that we looked at something that would take tens to a hundred years to complete, and. If we look all around us on this earth, we can see projects that required years and decades. The Great Wall of 
China, the pyramids, the uh, all of the great old structures, and the cathedrals were things that were not completed in two years. And yet, what do we do now if a uh, if a building or a bridge is not finished in a two-year span, we get very impatient for it to finish. And, and so another portion of the problem is that as a people and as a society, we don't have the patience to, uh, to put up with these very long projects. There are groups that are trying to look at 100-year projects, 100-year uh, starship is one such group. What can we do in 100 years? But I like to turn that around and say, what do we do now to ensure that in 100 years we are able to, to achieve this goal? That's part of the reason for the Homo Stellaris group, and it's part of the reason for the Homo Stellaris article. Well, how has science fiction played into this? Um... You bring up several examples, and it seems like this is an area where science fiction really has some effect, some real-world effect beyond entertainment or even art. I agree. I think it does. I think that in many ways, the dreaming that we do in science fiction is how we are going to inspire people, and it's how we're going to make these accomplishments. The Probably the best example of an inspiration from science fiction has always been the example of the Star Trek flip communicator. The communicator which Captain Kirk flipped it open and he talked to his ship. And when human technology on Earth developed the point where we had these wonderful cell phones that we could pull out and we could talk to some someone hundreds of miles away with no wires, what did we do is that some designer somewhere made it look like a Star Trek communicator as one of the very first things they did. So I think we have a means and a role of inspiring. If you ask an astronaut what got them, what inspired them, many of them you will find were science fiction readers. If you ask a person like me who works in the biomedical sciences what inspired me to do this, there is a very specific uh, science fiction book and TV show that I can mention that inspired me to do what I do. And you find that a lot in the people who want to think about space, who want to think about interplanetary exploration, and who want to talk about interstellar exploration. So I think we are in the position, in science fiction, we are in the position of inspiring the people who are going to make these accomplishments. Well, let's, let's hope you're, uh, you're right, <clears throat> and you make a strong ar argument for uh, what we have to do and where we have to go to if we want to do this. The um, article is Homo Stellaris Becoming the People of the Stars by Robert E. Hampson, and it is found in the Free Nonfiction 2016 collection at Bain eBooks. Rob, thank you very much for uh, being with us and discussing the article today. Oh, thank you, Tony. I'm always glad to. As you can tell, it's something I really feel strongly about. So I appreciate the opportunity to talk about it today. Thanks a lot. Now we continue with our complete audiobook serialization of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. It seems Cinnabar's chief spymaster is a mother also, and her son is determined to search for treasure in the midst of a civil war. Who better to hold the boy's hand and to take the blows directed at him than Captain Daniel Leary, the Republic of Cinnabar Navy's troubleshooter, and his friend the cyberspy Adele Mundy. The only thing certain in the struggle for control of the mining planet Corsera is that the rival parties are more dangerous to their own allies than to their opponents. Daniel and Adele face kidnappers, pirates, and a death squad even before they can get to the real business of ending the war on Corsera and bringing their charge home, 
maybe along with ancient alien treasure. Now here is the next entry of David Drake's The Sea Without a Shore. Chapter 25 Outside Hablinger on Coursera Daniel wished he could have found a quieter alternative for the temporary headquarters on the back of an air-cushioned truck, but there wasn't one if the command group remained near the siege lines. There were arguments for moving the command group much farther back, but there were no arguments that Daniel himself would have accepted even if the other members were willing. Look, what are we waiting for? said Administrator Tibbs, who certainly would have been willing to evacuate the command group. She wasn't exactly wringing her hands, but seemed to be trying to strangle her attaché case's handle. Daniel smiled, though he looked up into the night sky rather than directing his amusement toward Tibbs, the real cause of his amusement. She can't have understood how dangerous this really is, or she'd still be back in Brotherhood. We're waiting for an hour before dawn, Colonel Bourbon said. The time we set for the operation. That's only five minutes, said Tibbs. What difference would five minutes make? Quite a lot of difference for the troops out there, since we told them 443, snapped Lieutenant Angelotti. Colonel Bourbon had done a good job of hiding his frustration with the regiment's civilian head, but the naval lieutenant was younger and probably less politic by nature. Jumping the gun puts their lives at risk. A lot of them are probably still in their dugouts. Tibbs grimaced, but she held her tongue instead of saying, Who cares about those scum or words to that effect? Angelotti might have slapped Tibbs if she had. Daniel's smile hardened. Indeed, I might have slapped her, but probably not. I don't guess it'd make much difference, said one of the miners morosely. He took a long pull from the liter bottle which he and his companions had been passing among themselves since they arrived. Us folk don't pay a lot of attention to what townies say, and we bloody sure don't take orders from townies. The miners' representatives this morning weren't the trio which Daniel had met when he arrived at the siege lines five days earlier. These were all males and much of a type, thin-faced, wiry, and shorter than Daniel's own five feet nine inches. They looked similar enough that they might have been grandfather, son, and grandson. They ranged from an apparent twenty to sixty, but from conversation, Daniel doubted they were related. They'll be buried if they don't listen, said Angelotti. And anyway, nobody gave them orders, it was just a warning. Angelotti was keyed up, though it wasn't clear whether she was goaded by fear, she did understand the danger, or by hopeful anticipation. She was able to do her duty either way, Daniel supposed, and besides, she had nothing to do except be present. None of them really had anything to do. The youngest miner turned and spat over the side of the truck. Spitting outward may have been an afterthought, which Daniel appreciated. Eight people standing in the back of a one-ton vehicle didn't leave a great deal of open floor. This soft dirt, the miner said, why, that's nothing. You ought to see a cave-in back where we come from. Anyhow, said the oldest miner, I guess it's their business. You couldn't dig any depth into the delta's rich black soil without having the excavation collapse. The miners had simply adapted the system they used in their own tunnels to the situation. They used screw clamps to roll sheets of structural plastic into tubes. The diameter differed depending on the size of the sheet, but usually two meters, and welded the join. As they advanced the tunnel, they shoved the tube deeper and added segments at the surface end in the fashion of a well casing. If a rock layer shifted, it could flatten the tube, but the plastic was sturdy enough to withstand the more common problem of a flake, which might weigh tons, spalling off the tunnel roof. The sheets and forming equipment were available in quantity because they were in general use throughout the pro-independence territories. Under most conditions, the plastic liners kept the besiegers' dugouts here safe and even dry. Conditions were about to change. But as the miner had said, that was the business of the people who were at risk if they ignored the warning. Bourbon hugged himself and grimaced. If the Pantelarians knew that we've moved three quarters of our strength back, he said, they'd attack. They won't attack, Daniel said. He cleared his throat while he decided how to phrase the next comment. Officer Mundy would have given us plenty of warning, days of warning if there were any chance of them attacking. We're talking about the Pantelarians here, you'll recall. I don't see how she can be sure of that, said Tibbs. 
But there's only minutes to go. If the mine goes off at least, what happens? She looked up at the others in the truck bed. Her expression had gone from peevishly nervous to sudden concern. If something goes wrong with that, what do we do then? There shouldn't be any problem with the mine, mistress, Brother Graves said. He sounded so calmly certain that his tone alone banished doubt. It's quite a straightforward operation, something I've done hundreds of times. Many of the others involved have laid thousands of charges. You got that bloody right, said the young miner. Look, honey, if I thought you knew your job half as good as we know ours, I wouldn't be near so worried about all this circus. I think everybody here is competent, Graves said again, dampening a nervous exchange with his powerful calm. And most important, I think Captain Leary and his staff are competent. You? He nodded to the miners, and I had nothing to do but execute the captain's orders. I'm confident that we've done so ably. Daniel had brought Graves here not as the transformationist representative. Heimholtz remained in charge of the sect's field force, but because he was an engineer. Corsera's miners worked in hard rock, and few, if any, had any better notion of how to tunnel in the Delta environment than a boy at the beach would. Graves had used one of the drainage pumps as an excavator, carving the silt away with high-pressure water. By sloping the entrance tunnel at a slight downward angle, the tailings flowed back and cleaned the work face without additional effort. The only trick had been reducing the nozzle from 15 centimeters to 2 centimeters to keep the stream sufficiently precise. Controlling the hose required six husky miners, and the teams had to be replaced every few minutes. There were plenty of men and several women available. Besides, it made the miners feel good about their place in the independence movement. Miners had from the first provided most of manpower, but because of their individualism and lack of structure, they hadn't been involved in planning. Couldn't be involved in planning, but miners tended to think that outsiders from off-planet were keeping them in the dark out of contempt. Daniel's smile became wry. There was a degree of truth to the miners' belief, of course. People were complicated and generally further from perfect than one sometimes wished. Something's funny, Leary, Colonel Bourbon said. I was thinking that I wouldn't have much place in a perfect universe, Daniel said truthfully, and that if all women were perfect ladies, I would have had a great deal less fun. But now to work, I think. Smiling broadly, Daniel keyed the portable communications unit clamped to the back of the truck's cab. In speaker mode, he said, Kaisha, this is six. Report your status, please, over. The others in the back of the vehicle were staring at him. Lieutenant Angelotti pursed her lips and murmured, Can the Pantelarians listen to that? No, said Graves, without taking his eyes off Daniel. Adele set this up so that we're actually using the satellite link through Pantelarian headquarters, Daniel thought. The Pantelarians were intercepting and perhaps decoding ordinary independence communications, but they weren't checking their own. He didn't say that aloud because the others wouldn't have found it reassuring. Besides, this wasn't the time to discuss communication security with laymen. Daniel wrapped his knuckles on the roof of the cab to get the attention of the driver, a sergeant from the regiment. It was their truck. Hogg sat beside him. Emmings, he said, bending close to the open window into the cab. Bring us up to full power, hover if you can, and get ready for one hell of a ride. The intake flow built to a roar, and a bearing began to sing. The motor doesn't have to survive long, Daniel thought at the back of his mind, but I sure hope it's got another few minutes. Aloud, he said. Colonel Bourbon, would you push the button, please? Not me, Larry, Bourbon said. This was your plan, you do the honors. Daniel thought, then smiled again. The obvious person to set off the charge was Brother Graves. But though the transformationist was too nice a person to react to an insult, it certainly would be an insult to a man who strove for peace. Instead, Daniel gestured to the eldest of the miners and said, Sir, I think that the people who did the work should have any honor there is going. Will you press the button, please? I wish I'd heard his name. The miner handed the bottle to one of his colleagues and took the necessary step forward to the communications unit. He looked suddenly diffident. He reached out, then looked questioningly at Daniel. Kaisha, 
Daniel said. This is six. Wait one, over. He pointed to the miner and dipped his finger. The older man thrust down forcefully on the execute button. Daniel couldn't see what happened to the course of the river a mile closer to the Pantellerian positions because the truck was behind an angle of the levee. But he did see the enormous gout of mud and muddy water lift into the sky. An instant later, the shock wave arrived through the ground, bouncing the truck like a tennis ball. Five seconds later, the deafening roar swept over them. But by then, that was old news. Brotherhood on Coursera Adele had real-time imagery of Haplinger in the center, but most of her display was given over to the commo thread she was following. Events in Hablinger would affect her, but she couldn't affect them. She preferred to give her attention to things she could do something about. Kaisha, this is six, said the console. It was the signal they were waiting for. Report your status, please, over. Six, this is five, said Vessi. All is according to plan, over. Adele was at the back of the Kaisha's console. Vessi was on the command seat. Adele was aware that Pasternak had lighted the thrusters, but only because the plasma exhaust put a buzz across the radio frequency spectrum. Her equipment filtered it out. But the buzz was a factor in her conscious universe, which the ship's physical vibration was not. Adele's body might have been aware of being shaken, but her mind was where she lived. Lady Mundy, said Vessi, using a two-way link. Is it all right if I talk to you over? The first response that went through Adele's mind was, I'm busy, you idiot. I'm trying to keep Daniel from being killed. Adele heard the words mentally before they reached her tongue, fortunately, and the shock of embarrassment brought her to her senses. It was as unlikely that anything she was doing at the moment would matter to the Hablinger operation as it was that a meteorite would plunge from the sky and destroy the console at which she was working. To imagine otherwise was staggering arrogance, disgusting arrogance. Yes, of course, Captain, Adele said. Is there something in particular that I should be looking for over? No, said Vessi. Lady Mundy. Officer Mundy, Adele said, correcting the ship's captain in a fashion that she wouldn't have dared to do if she hadn't been Lady Mundy in her mind as well as in Vessi's. She smiled like a sphinx. But whenever possible, Adele followed RCN protocol. Whenever I think of it, I follow protocol. Which wasn't as often as one might wish, but there wasn't a problem so long as she served under Daniel. And Adele could not imagine serving in the RCN under anyone except Daniel. Officer, Adele, Vessie said. Please, I need to talk to you, to someone who understands and who'll be honest, which is you alone on this planet. I need advice, over. Go ahead. Adele said. Perhaps I am Lady Mundy today after all. That was another entry in our complete audiobook serialization of The Sea Without a Shore by David Drake. And that's it for the podcast. Thanks to Audible.com and to podcast theme composer Ruth Judkowitz. And a space-adapted round of applause that actually is the sound of one hand clapping... Plus our thanks, gratitude, and plaudits for great discussion to Robert E. Hampson, author of Homo Stellaris, Becoming the People of the Stars. Please join us next time here at the hammering heart of science fiction and fantasy. And keep reaching for the stars. 